will introduce. Great. All right. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll eventually be, yeah, sharing my screen. Um, I, I have like a slide deck put together, but um, to introduce myself first, um, I'm Derek Shen. Uh, I live right outside of Boston. Um, I'm MIT class of 2023, so very much not an alumni yet. Um, so still an undergrad on course 614, just declared it earlier this summer. Um, let's see, what else? Um, oh, an interesting update about MIT because I don't know, maybe you guys would be interested, but um, so regarding coronavirus and the next school year, only seniors will be invited back to campus. So um, I'm currently in the midst of essentially searching for housing to live with friends during the fall semester. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna be giving my presentation and at some point I actually have to leave a little early because I have to go to a <laughs> go to a showing for an apartment in Boston uh, to go uh, to go take pictures of a house uh, where me and my friends could be living next fall. So um, yeah, I mean, like I'll try to keep the presentation, um, you know, pretty succinct. It's uh, the topic I'm presenting on today is yeah, yes, Winky. Before we forget, can one of you or some of you take a photo or a screenshot of this just for Derek and for our group? to memorialize his presentation, our <laughs> presentation. Oh, great, Patrick, please do so. Sure, okay, so I'm just gonna... Smile. <laughs> hold on. Okay, ready? Yes. One, two, three. All right, <laughs> let me just make sure I got the file. Winking, you want me to just email it to you? Yeah, take another one just in case. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's really... Doing the stereotypical Asian thing. I know. <laughs> this going to be? Virtual, virtually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. okay cool. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Pat. No problem. Go ahead, Derek. <laughs> All right. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I've actually this summer I've been working with Michael. Um, so yeah, actually, you know, Michael's at a consulting firm. So I've been um, you know, working with him. And in addition to the work I'm doing currently, which is um, in a little bit of investment strategy, in that I also you know like did some work into you know like looking looking at the dollar, you know, as a reserve currency, and also just like in a little bit of like I guess the field of international finance. So. Um, I put a deck together just essentially, you know, like hoping, you know, like in 15 to 20 short minutes, you know, you guys can get a grasp or a general idea of, you know, where, where the dollar stands right now and, you know, what, you know, what implications it has, you know, down the road, you know, five, 10 years down the road um, and what it, what our economy stands and lines up with other economies and, you know, how um, economics and politics sometimes come together and, you know, um, have different effects. So, yeah, I'll run through the deck and after after my talk actually I hope to um share a link with you guys. I guess I'll share it right now, but um it's um it's a link to um a a, a Miro board which is like kind of like a virtual uh whiteboard. So, I don't know if you guys can access it if you're on computers, but um if you click on the link it should bring you to um I believe um a Miro board which is a virtual whiteboard. Um and I was just hoping after the talk, you know, like, because it's a very speculative, you know, topic I'm talking about, if, you know, maybe you could just jot down some, you know, sticky notes or ideas of what you, what you guys have in terms of, you know, speculation or whatever you took out of the talk, anything is fine. I think that's better than just having a very one-way Q&A, which could, you know, be very, uh, very bland or like, you know, just very one-way. So I hope that's a better way of doing it or using that, you know, last five to 10 minutes for the Q&A. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Does it work for you guys? Uh, like Eric, I tried it and it takes me to a sign up page. Oh boy, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, so. Okay, I see. Do you guys need um Michael, can I ask you real quick? Do you need an account to access the mural board or can you access it without? Um let me see if I can change the permission. Okay. So that yeah. It's so fantastic, Michael is helping Derek out. <laughs> <laughs> Real help, yeah. I actually, had, I actually had no idea about Miro until Michael introduced it to me, because that's oh. usually how we do our meetings, and it's actually, um, it's pretty neat, so I, I thought it's a, you know, it's another pretty neat technology, I don't know. 
that I thought, you know, I could try to use in this talk. So <laughs> That's great because I didn't know about mirrors either. So this is one way for me to learn. Right. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see. All right, let me, let me try another link real quick. How about this one? If you guys can't access it, then maybe, you know, you guys, maybe you guys can just view it and then, you know, we can go round table and whatever your ideas you have, I can just put it down. Um, you know, it's pretty cool to, you know, visually see something. Um, like, you know, on, on a board rather than just, you know, it being up there. Yeah, that worked. That yeah? Worked. Okay, great, yeah. Do you guys have editing access or do you just have viewing access? Um, let's see, I, I looks like I can add, no, I, I can add in stuff. Oh, that's great, okay, yeah, great. So, yeah, okay, so, okay, perfect. Does everybody else, is everybody else able to toy around with it, able to edit? Um, I don't know how this works. <laughs> great okay so just look in the I think, last I, panel. I yeah. right okay great yeah so you see right you can like drag like post-it notes on um and you can you know and you can write inside of them yeah mm -hmm. so you know i was just hoping to use that as you know a means of like getting ideas out i think it's a pretty actually effective way to you know and just get ideas out in a pretty you know round table format but yeah i mean like we, we can handle that after after the talk um i wouldn't want to waste too much time just going through the technicals of Miro, but yeah all right, great. So without further ado, I'll, I'll share my screen um, and let, let me know if you guys are able to, ooh, okay. Um, I think winking, I think it says host disabled oh. attendee screen sharing. Yeah. I need to add you. I'm making you a co-host. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, okay, I can share it now. Okay, good. All right, perfect. Can you guys see? Yep. All right, great. Okay, yeah. So um, essentially, this this whole deck is like kind of like a high level overview, or like I guess general, you know, to dip your toes inside of you know, look at the dollar. Um, you know, the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency, and that puts us in a pretty special position. Um, and it's like really given us like a lot of advantages um, as a country, and it's like a lot of a reason of why we're such a powerful country nowadays. So it's a uh, pretty cool to understand, you know, where it all comes from economically. I guess you can say. Um, so yeah, so there are a couple things um, I'm hoping to cover today, you know, just a like a general contextualizing the dollar. I, at least for me, I wasn't too like familiar with like the dollar, or I guess like the US dollar, um, and in where it stood uh, with other currencies. Um, next, we're going to be looking at, you know, like, why there are some changing dollar sentiments, why there are some like, you know, some big players around the world essentially are starting to get irritated by the US um, and the US dollar and what that means. And thirdly, we're going to look at, you know, like, what, what, what are the future scenarios down the road? Um, something that we can kind of expect, you know, five to 10 years down the road. Um, that's pretty neat, actually. Um, so, yeah. So, first, um, yeah. So, essentially, an intro to the dollar. The dollar is um, our world's reserve currency. Um, and it essentially became the world's reserve currency out of um, something called the Bretton Woods Agreement, which happened in 1944, which is after World War II. So I don't know if you guys remember like a quick history lesson, but after World War II, the U.S. was like in a very good spot in comparison to a lot of like countries in Europe. Um, you know, we had Marshall Plan and a lot of things that, you know, um, you know, put us in a pretty good spot. Um, and, uh, you know, but the dollar really became the dominant currency um, out of, you know, a couple actions um, like breaking off of the Bretton Woods Agreement, actually. Um, so the dollar actually broke off of the gold standard, essentially. Um, and this was important because like the gold standard essentially was like theoretically holding our government in check um, in terms of overspending, right? Um, and this is kind of, you know, where we start to see, you know, the US starting to, you know, you know, pack up a lot of debt, you know, like we, we often, you know, like we operate off of, off of a lot of deficits nowadays. Um, so like one very important thing that we can look at um, that I thought was pretty neat actually, um, in terms of, you know, where the dollar got to where it is today, you know, back in 1975, there's actually an agreement between the U.S. and the House of Saud, um, where basically Saudi Arabia agreed to sell all of its crude oil on the world's market in dollars in return for U.S. military arms um, and diplomatic support, which is very interesting because, um, like, you know, like Saudi Arabia was like very in, in turmoil back then, essentially. Um, 
And it's uh, pretty cool to see, you know, how like it's not just economics, it's also pretty political, um, you know, where we got to where we are today. Um, so in terms of other things, you know, like, you know, and like where we are today, you know, the US is home to less than 5% of the world population and 20% of the world GDP, but 80% of international payments are actually made in the dollar. Um, you know, so like oil among many other transactions around the world. Um, you know, and we have, you know, $28 trillion of relatively liquid dollar denominated debt held outside of the US, which is, you know, just a very large number. Um, so yeah, but in, in essentially, even, even with all of this dominance and where we are today, um, essentially the dollar is facing a challenge by um, um, kind of opposition, growing opposition by large countries like China, Russia, um, EU, uh, like even Europe. Um, against the dollar, essentially, because uh, America has an overuse of a lot of economic sanctions um, that are starting to irritate, you know, big countries, you know, big countries that have a lot of power that really weren't in a place to challenge the U.S. before. Um, so, yeah. So what are these changing dollar sentiments? Um, you know, I, I won't read this entire slide. It's a lot of words, but I'll generally go through the ideas. Right. So there are two acts, actually, that have essentially started to really, you know, irritate foreign like big foreign powerhouse countries. Um, one of them is the IEEPA, and the other one is the CAATSA. Um, so essentially, the IEEPA essentially is like a very broad act that was passed in 1997 that essentially said that uh, the president has the right to block transactions and freeze assets of those who constitute a threat to the national security, foreign policy, or economy of the U.S., and that is so broad. I mean, like, that is just so broad that, you know, theoretically, you know, a lot of countries could find themselves on the, like, the receiving end of U.S. punitive measures, you know, just if, you know, like, their foreign policy is not to America's liking. Um, and essentially, you know, like, for reference, the CAATSA, essentially, or like, um, the SDN is a long list of essentially all these countries and companies or corporations that have, you know, are under now like economic sanction by the U.S. because they've irritated the U.S. Um, and just for reference, you know, in 2013 the list was 577 pages, and now in 2019 the page like it's 1,307 pages long. So, I mean, like that's a long increase, you know, in the number of entities that are you know essentially under sanction or facing punitive measures by the U.S. Um, and a great example, you know, is just, you know, Russia's, you know, main arms export, uh, like export entity um, was put on this list, essentially, because like, um, they engaged like in transaction with a Chinese military procurement company. So that wasn't to the US's liking. So essentially, they put them on, you know, this sanctioned list, so they would face punishment and try to interfere with Russia's ability to conduct bilateral trade with China. Um, so really interesting, um, some really like small, like, you know, um, small, you know, actions taken by the U.S. that are starting to irritate some big countries. Um, so, yeah, fun fact, today, you know, one in 10 countries fall under U.S. sanctions. So that's a lot of countries. Um, you know, these are just a couple to name, um, you know, like Russia, you know, North Korea, Myanmar, Sudan, Venezuela, Cuba. Um, yeah, so, so here's the big question at hand, right? Um, like that was all kind of like a prelude, right, to the ultimate question. So what, 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 what is coming down the road for the dollar? Um, what are the future scenarios? Um, so yeah, this third section is essentially focusing on these three scenarios that I've kind of, you know, put together as a speculation. Um, and I won't go over these slides because this is, because I was essentially trying to present this information under a scenario thinking framework. Um, this is, you know, kind of like a well-known framework that exists, you know, for speculation and for future events. So essentially like a very short version of these slides is that essentially this is, Treat, treat these three scenarios down the road as essentially like you're well equipped now, like you're, you're well aware of, you know, like what could happen down the road. Um, and like, you know, like as long as you are aware of all these possible scenarios, then maybe it would help you or maybe it would help a company, you know, somewhere down the road, um, you know, in terms of being ready for, you know, the dollar um, or foreign currencies even. So, yeah, so I've organized it into three essentially future scenarios from most likely all the way down to least likely. Um, here it is placed on a grid, essentially. So I've kind of fleshed it out into three scenarios where um, the least likely scenario is a quick loss of dollar dominance in our, you know, international, you know, in our global financial system and, you know, an increased role of alternative currencies, you know, currencies like the Chinese yuan, um, you know, like the ruble or like, um, you know, other currencies like the euro even, or alternatives like cryptocurrency, um, like digital alternatives. Um, 
for um, uh, now the, the, the less likely scenario is, um, you know, like a continuation of dollar dominance, like a, like a, just like a, like the dollar will remain in its very dominant position. Um, and like, there's a decreased role of alternative currencies. Essentially the dollar will stay as the king of the hill. Um, now that's also pretty less likely, but most likely essentially, and I guess the most important scenario to keep in mind is that, you know, the dollar will retain, I guess it's, you know, status as the world reserve currency it'll start to diminish its, you know, gradually diminish its role, you know, as a dominant player and become one player of many, you know, like a basket of currencies almost. Um, and we will see an increased role of alternative currencies, you know, and I'll, and I'll break into all of those um, as we go down. So scenario one, um, a loss of dollar dominance and the dollar diminishes. Um, essentially, you know, um, you know, there, there are people that, you know, strongly think that the dollar could lose its status as the world reserve currency. I mean, like, I won't read that quote, but you know, there's, you know, even like a JP Morgan strategist, like this was a quick Google search. I mean, like, um, there are people publishing articles, people writing about it, you know, people writing about, you know, how the dollar's threatened or, you know, how like, you know, we will see a fall of the dollar, you know, five to 10 years down the road. Um, so what does that mean? And what does the world look like? Um, so, you know, there are a couple ramifications that we could feel, um, you know, like, I, I guess kind of like a chain of events, right? Like, so essentially, if the dollar falls, right, interest rates on U.S. government debt will rise in order to attract sufficient capital to continue the finance, the U.S. debt, you know, such essentially debt fueled spending spree, um, which will, you know, then divert, you know, amounts of spending currently earmarked for things like Medicaid, Social Security, defense and infrastructure projects, um, you know, and as interest rates for federal uh, for government debt increases, then so too in chain reaction do rates for other debts like residential mortgages and corporate debt. Um, and essentially this drives down, you know, we could see, you know, this driving down the value of our homes and the prices of publicly traded equity. So I guess on a more, you know, individual, you know, consumer level, you know, these are some of the, you know, things, effects we could feel, um, you know, if the dollar does diminish. Um, and essentially, you know, like national wealth overall in the U.S., you know, will be reduced, I guess, essentially and, and quickly. Um, and, you know, like as, and yeah, as I say, as investments are diverted from the U.S. dollar denominated equity securities to others, perhaps in Europe or China, reduced demands for U.S. equities, you know, could also further erode the value of our stocks, you know, resulting in further wealth decline. Um, so, yeah, so who are the actors then, you know, who, who will, you know, who has the potential to replace the dollar, you know, either as the world reserve currency or as just the most dominant currency in our global financial system. So, um, so yeah, um, in, in terms of that, we're, we're looking at, um, ooh, sorry, um, we're looking at, you know, like the Chinese yuan, the euro, um, you know, things like gold, um, which have played a prominent role in our history and uh, even cryptocurrency, right, which is a pretty radical alternative. Um, so, yeah, you know, there are a couple of indications that we're headed towards, you know, like it's not completely unfeasible, but it's very unlikely, um, you know, and a couple of things that could cause, you know, the dollar to essentially fall from its role, you know, um, to, from what we're used to, to, you know, like being not prominent at all. Um, you know, we have just extremely high levels of debt. I'm pretty sure everyone's aware of that. Um, like your average person would honestly pre be pretty aware that the U.S. has extremely high levels of debt. Um, and there are also studies that, you know, like with, you know, with ratios of public debt to GDP of being above 80 percent, um, you know, they're vulnerable to a fiscal crunch. Um, um, and this was done by Carmen Reinhart and Kenneth Rogoff, who are, you know, um, at, the, at the World Bank and at the International Monetary Fund. Um, so pretty interesting numbers. So right now the U.S. is sitting at 107 percent. So, um, you know, uh, we're, we're I guess you could say we're in a vulnerable position. I wouldn't say we're in a vulnerable position, but, you know, the, I guess there are studies out there. Um, you know, I, I guess the previous world reserve currency was the pound sterling, the British pound sterling. And essentially they, they were sitting at, you know, like 10 percent, like the cost of servicing the British debt was 10 percent. Um, you know, and we're, and we're sitting at 13% right now. And essentially they lost their role as world reserve currency when, you know, a pretty black swan event, like, you know, world, like world war or war conflict like that, you know, um, essentially like wreak havoc. Um, and essentially they lost their position uh, pretty quickly in coming years. Um, and also finally, I guess like there's, there could just, you know, potentially be a loss of faith in the dollar, right? Like, you know, like a lot of foreign countries or foreign investors could lose their, you know, like, trust, um, I guess, in the U.S. to honor its debt obligations. And that's another big thing. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, so why, why this scenario is unlikely? So, essentially, I proposed all, the, all these alternatives, but now I'm going to kind of rip them down uh, one by one and, 
to you know show them why they're I guess they're quite not not quite ready essentially and why the dollar's kind of safe in the position it's in right now um, and why these things aren't ready to take over the dollar um, so gold essentially gold I said is like it's very limited I, I, I guess in terms of liquidity to like its supply you know gold is like you know, essentially like limited to its production, you know, it's mined and a lot of it is used in jewelry. It's just, you know, the world reserve currency is like, needs to be very, a very liquid asset. And that's just like not there for gold essentially. So, you know, like while gold has played a very important role in like the hit in, in our history in our global financial system, um, I, I like, it's probably not going to have like a very dominant role um, in, in the years coming. So cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency is a very interesting one. Um, I don't know if anyone like I guess like has strong opinions on cryptocurrency, but I guess like by the by the fact cryptocurrency is like pretty vulnerable to hacking incidents. Um, also, it, it just like be pretty tough in terms of you know gaining wide acceptance, um, especially you know like it's it's a digital you know system. It's very you know like very very radical, um, um, and you know and and because of that and because of you know like it's very you know like I guess like like very like I guess like off the map like reputation or like you know very decentralized reputation it's just not quite there yet um so yeah so this, this is just like a fun insertion so michael and i actually toyed around um sometime last month and there's actually some a, a website called erasure bay and essentially what they do is it's kind of like a legal black market actually i don't even know black markets are legal but but um Essentially, you can just type in any request that you have and you can just wager a certain amount of DAI tokens, which is a cryptocurrency, and it can be fulfilled by anyone around the world, essentially. It's pretty neat, actually. Um, you can request anything and you can put up like, a, like a, a reward for it and anyone, someone you don't even know, someone you don't have to trust can fulfill it for you. Um, and essentially, the whole catch of this, though, is that you have the right to like burn, like destroy, like destroy the stake essentially destroy like the fulfiller stake. Um, so it's pretty interesting, just a pretty neat, you know, look into why cryptocurrency, you know, might not be ready now, but they're very interesting implications for it. You know, that could be, you know, coming down the road. Um, so yeah, um, I guess the big player, you know, though that we should consider is the Chinese yuan. I mean like that, that's like, I guess the biggest one, um, you know, like, you know, China's, you know, like economic size is just increasing. Um, you know, by, by heaps and like, you know, like we, we see it becoming a very prominent player um, in the world now. So like naturally a lot of people would think the Yuan could become an alternative or, you know, take the dollar's place. Um, so I guess there are a couple criteria to look at. Um, I guess there are uh, five of them. So like for, um, for any, any currency uh, to be ready to become a world reserve currency. Um, so essentially, they are economic size, an open capital account, a flexible exchange rate, their macroeconomic policy, and just financial market development. And again, I won't break too specifically into these, but you know, just looking into it, China actually probably only really is prepared for about two of these parameters or two of these criteria. I guess the biggest one that's really important that tells us you know, why the yuan isn't quite ready to become a world reserve currency is because of the last one, actually, because of its financial market um, development. Um, you know, like um, essentially what, what, what's important for, you know, a, a world reserve currency is for it to be a very liquid asset, like I, I, like I said earlier. Um, and I, I, in terms of like, you know, I guess like government debt, it's like, you know, it, it needs to be like a safe and liquid asset. Um, and it's very low in China, essentially. Um, so, you know, I think that's the biggest indication, you know, and like I have a number there, like um, their overall, China's overall debt market was valued at $3.8 trillion in you know, 2012, which is just significantly lower um, than that of, you know, top three, you know, reserve currency areas, which is the US, the Eurozone, and, Eurozone and Japan, which is the Japanese yen. Um, yeah, so I mean, like, now, now that's out of the way, we can, you know, consider scenario two, right? Um, so what does scenario two look like, which is a complete, you know, continuation of dollar dominance, um, and just like a decreased, you know, like, or decreased or just like, there's no space for alternative currencies to rise. So, you know, um, so who are the players here? You know, like it's going to be the dollar and it will continue to be the dollar. That's what the scenario looks at. Um, you know, and while we think, you know, we would have a lot of privileges if the dollar continued, you know, there actually are a couple of, you know, ramifications that we could see, um, you know, um, you know, of which is most likely our, you know, increasing trade deficit, um, which could become a major obstacle for us. 
you know, um, because we're the world reserve currency, we have a lot of privileges, like, you know, like, um, essentially like what happens is our, a lot, a lot of our companies, you know, like get very easy access to capital. Um, and like, essentially like, um, a lot of our companies essentially become overvalued in a sense. Um, and it actually ends up hurting the American economy. Um, which is like very interesting. Um, you know, like, uh, like a lot of foreign goods are less expensive to us firms and households, you know, and, you know, it spurs them to consume cheaper foreign goods. Um, you know, and imports just continue and continue to increase and, you know, like, you know, this increasing trade deficit will eventually catch up to us, you know, and harm us. Um, so that's important to keep in mind as well, right? Like there are privileges, but there are also ramifications. Um, okay, so this is just a hunky slide. I won't really break into this, but um, so yeah, so what are the indications? Essentially, the whole point of this is that Rusa bonds, Carter bonds, you know, we've had a history of where the dollar is kind of threatened, um, where we've been kind of in a crunch, where the dollar has been, you know, questionable. And, you know, people have been thinking about, you know, like, um, you know, either dumping the dollar or, you know, there's just like decreased confidence in the dollar. Each time the U.S. government has found a way to respond. And most of it is through, you know, issuing these bond programs or, you know, like, quote unquote, dollar defense packages, um, which are very interesting. And they're, um, yeah, I won't break into the history of it too much. But also just in current times, you know, an indication that the dollar is really entrenching itself and taking advantage of the situation is with COVID-19, right? Like the U.S. jumped on the gun um, with federal, like renewing their Federal Reserve swap lines, because um, essentially there's a lot of panic uh, in foreign countries. So in offshore dollar markets, they're called, um, and essentially we like, essentially financed a, like a lot of money. Like I believe like the number here is like, at last count, ten of fourteen members have four hundred forty-six billion dollars, um, in, in you know in U.S. dollars. So you know that's just another indication that you know. You know, like events like these, like panicked events, or I guess like black swan events, you know, can actually entrench the US dollar um, a lot more than you'd think. Um, so yeah, so why is this scenario unlikely? Um, you know, this scenario is unlikely because unlike before, unlike in history, now there are a lot of big players, um, a lot of big players that are becoming irritated with these new US sanctions uh, and economic sanctions that have never been seen before. Um, you know, and, and we see these countries starting to take actions and starting to find little loopholes in the system and working their way around, you know, being under the U.S.'s, you know, like, I guess, like, policy or U.S.'s, you know, like, big brother eye, I guess, in terms, you know, in terms of economic, you know, transactions with other countries or foreign transactions. Um, I guess one I can name to you is that last one in this last bullet point, you know, um, Europe um, actually, you know, like it is creating like an alternative like payment system. Um, Europe, you know, like the US like broke off the Iran agreement, but Europe still wanted to do deals with Iran. And then the US was punishing Europe for doing deals with Iran because the US was like, no, we broke off deals with Iran. So you can't do deals with Iran anymore. So Europe essentially created a barter agreement with Iran, which is very neat, um, you know, to just bypass and not do transactions in dollars because essentially all these transactions are being done in dollars. So they're finding alternatives. Um, we also see, you know, like digital cryptocurrencies, like, you know, China's like, I'll break into it a little more later, but China's breaking into like an ERMB, which is kind of like, I guess, like the first like central bank backed cryptocurrency, um, which is pretty neat. Um, so yeah, this last scenario. So I guess this last scenario is kind of like a culmination of keeping in mind those past two scenarios that I talked about, right? Like, so essentially we've kind of unrooted like the fact that, you know, like, the dollar can't remain, you know, the most dominant forever because we're seeing a lot of big players get really irritated. Um, but also, you know, the dollar isn't really in a position to lose its, you know, leading status. It's not really going to go anywhere. Um, it's not going to lose out, you know, as a very dominant player. Um, so yeah, where does that lead us? That leads us like kind of in like a pretty like, um, I guess like middle situation where we see like a diversification of currencies. You know, I think we can expect to see a diversification of currencies down the road. Um, you know, five to 10 years down the road, um, you know, and, and these are a couple of the implications, you know, there are consequences and benefits, you know, like I said earlier, you know, it could be beneficial because, you know, like a lot of U.S. multinational companies may be compelled to, you know, then keep manufacturing in the U.S. and then, you know, like the cost of foreign goods would be higher and then, you know, there's a trickle down effect essentially, you know, more Americans are working, you know, it benefits the economy. Um, but, you know, we also lose out on a lot of the exorbitant like, privileges that we felt before. Um, you know, with like a weak dollar, I, I guess. Um, so yeah, so who are the players then? You know, it's like a basket, right? Like, you know, like, I guess like a, the yen, the euro, you know, the pound sterling, the dollar, you know, even like cryptocurrency. Um, 
in the Japanese yen. So, you know, like, um, again, like this is, uh, these, these couple slides are just like <laughs> a long list of, you know, like essentially why this scenario is likely and why it's coming. Um, I'll just keep it very short in each one, but like China, right? Like what are a couple of the indications that like, you know, like that will gradually reduce the role of the dollar um, and why, you know, the Chinese yuan will come up. You know, the, I, like, I, the world is becoming increasingly bipolar, if not tripolar in its trade um, and in just terms of capital flow. Um, like, um, you know, like, like I mentioned before, that ERMB is becoming pretty prominent. It's being tested out in multiple Chinese cities actually right now. I don't know if anybody knows about that, but um, pretty neat. Um, and also there's something called the China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is like the new, like the new Silk Road. It's been dubbed as the new Silk Road. Um, pretty interesting. And also, you know, um, you know, the U.S. in the middle, you know, Saudi Arabia are having, you know, pretty like some tension, at, at least recently. Um, and, you know, like who, who's going to fill that void in terms of, you know, like that oil void, um, you know, and, and, you know, the petrodollar, the quote unquote petrodollar could be replaced by petro yuan. Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of Russia, Russia actually, you know, replaced all their dollar holdings with purchases of gold, actually. So they're actually just holding gold currencies, essentially, um, you know, and they're finding ways to trade without dollars. They're incentivizing foreign countries to do trade with them, um, essentially in rubles instead, and they'll give them benefits in return. Um, pretty neat. And, you know, also just in terms of geopolitical interest, you know, Russia, you know, would, it would be in Russia's, you know, good interest to see, you know, like, I guess like the dollar, you know, take, take a less dominant stance. Um, you know, Europe in general, you know, I, I guess like, you know, you see like, you know, also this, you know, like Russia, they're circumventing U.S. sanctions by, you know, like creating instruments to, you know, like just like circumvent the dollar and circumvent doing transactions in dollars. Um, you know, there are also a couple of political tensions, you know, like, you know, in the couple of years that Trump has been in office, you know, you see like, you know, um, you know, Trump, you know, withdraw from Paris climate accords, you know, attacks on NATO, you know, support for Brexit, all, all these things. Um, you know, they all have, you know, they all play roles. Um, and I guess European interest in seeing, you know, like the dollar kind of face a decline. Um, and, you know, and, and when you see these big players, essentially, like um, big players start this de-dollarization scheme or this movement, you know, it will be hard to, you know, stop it, especially when a lot of countries jump on board. Um, you know, it's in a lot of countries or foreign countries interest to see, you know, diversification of currencies. Um, so, you know, that is something, you know, we have to keep our eyes peeled for essentially, you know, like this is all speculative at the end of the day, right? Like this is, you know, something I'm not telling you, you know, the dollar, you know, will definitely, you know, reduce or whatever, but, you know, there are pretty good headings or pretty good signs that that's where we're headed. So, you know, that's the whole point of this, you know, these couple slides and, you know, I think I've run a little bit over time, but you know, that's, that's the whole takeaway. That's the key takeaway. So, you know, um, I hope you now have a better sense. Um, you know, it gets pretty rambly at times, but as long as you have the sense that, you know, like the dollar is seeing, you know, competition now, you know, we're not in such like, we're not in the king's seat all the time now, you know, we're seeing, you know, a diverse set of players come in and threaten the dollar. Um, and you know, it could have implications for us. Um, so yeah. So I guess that sums it all up. I mean, like, um, I, I guess like now, I guess like, I guess if you guys could transition back to that Miro board, um, you know, I, I think it would be cool if everyone could like, I guess, put one or two sticky notes down, um, you know, just on their thoughts or on their speculations, you know, maybe on cryptocurrency or on, you know, like the Chinese yuan or anything you know of, or maybe any questions, um, that'd be great. So uh, thank you for listening, everyone. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. I don't see that board. Sorry. You don't see the board? All right. Um, so it's in the chat I sent. Is everyone else able to see it? And Tom came in late. And in our past experience, mm -hmm. if you put something in the chat and someone comes in late, he won't see it. So can you re-put that link? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so Thomas, I don't know how much of it you were here for, but the whole um, time. Enough to get the gist of what you were talking about. I have a couple of comments and um, um, about some of the uh, presentation. Uh, you know, I am pro-dollar and pro-US. Mm. And um, 
I do agree with most of your views, but I think it'll take a much longer time. We're talking, you know, decades, maybe a hundred years before we see something like this. And the, one of the main reasons I think is because uh, I recently was on this Facebook debate with somebody where they were saying that, oh, everyone else in every other country is getting so much more aid and all we give our citizens is $1,200. And my immediate response to that was first I debunked it because it turns out that maybe there are some European countries giving their citizens more money on a monthly basis. But I said, look at the, look at the tax rates. You're looking at anywhere from 30, 45 to 55 to 60 percent tax rates in every country other than the U.S. So, uh, you know, you, my argument was you get what you put in. Um, some other comments I have is that uh, we're in a lucky position in the United States that in that we still have innovation and that drives the economies of the world going forward, meaning that we still have intellectual and artistic uh, innovation like Disney, we have, we're lucky enough to have Tesla. And uh, for those of you who have Tesla stock, you're pretty happy today, uh, went up another 10%. Um, but as some of the other major currencies, I think, you know, for example, Japan, they have deflation over there. So, I mean, I don't think, I think the days of Japan becoming a, being a world leader, even in Asia are gone. Uh, China, the problem that's coming to light in the last uh, few months with the COVID crisis is that the Western world has a deep, deep anti-Asian fear. It's been around since the, the discovery of Asia, right? And some of those things are coming to light right now. So I think that will prevent the Chinese yuan from ever being a world uh, a dominant currency. Um, Euro problem is Germany has is too strong in the Euro. And you've got other problems with uh, smaller countries like Switzerland never going on the Euro and then now uh, Great Britain coming off the Euro, right? So they have their problems to sort out where, again, we don't even know if the Euro is gonna be around in 20 or 30 years. And as much as everyone likes to rag on a dollar, uh, at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, I put my money on the dollar. But thank you for the presentation. I did, did not know about that bond, the weakness of those bond things. That was a very interesting point. I'm gonna look up some more information on that. Thanks. Of course. Yeah.